Welcome to the Developer Tribe where we delve into the process and practice of coaches, educators and beyond. We're back with episode 10 of season 3, this time with a brilliant coach of junior golfers. His company recently celebrated their 10 year anniversary and you can hear in this episode how that journey and his coaching has evolved. Enjoy and as always thanks for being here however you got here and with that let's jump in. My guest today is a PGA professional of over 25 years and coach and director of Jolf, focusing on the coaching of junior golfers. He recently delivered a presentation on learning how to become a better coach of children, which we'll get into his thoughts on today. And you can gain even further insight on via his podcast, The Jolf Man. It's a pleasure to introduce to the pod, Neil Plimmer. How are you doing today? Well, thank you for having me. Um, because of work and because of lockdown starting to ease, haven't had these conversations for a little while and I do find them I don't know whether they're therapy or what but thank you for having me no I, I absolutely find them therapeutic and it's <laughs> um it's just I mean they, the, the reason I put my pod together I'm I'm suspect it'd be the same for you is just totally a selfish endeavor of just speaking to people that um are like-minded enough that you can have a, a great conversation but then also might give a, a slightly opposing view as well yeah, I, I found I found listening to others was sort of fine. I found trying to write really hard, reading blogs, ooh, tricky. So I just thought it's got to be about voice. Let's just start throwing the voice out there and see where it lands. So yeah, looking forward to our chat. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing how this one lands. Uh, so look, start off by telling us a bit more about you know your career trajectory and what sparked the move to coaching junior golfers. I've been, a, I've been a golf professional now for 25 years. Um, so started out in a quite a traditional way where, you know, I played golf, did okay, um, wanted to earn my living playing, but very quickly realised that that was never going to happen. So um, had had the opportunity to work at a, a number of different golf clubs, you know, working in the shop, looking after the members, selling equipment and playing a little bit and then mostly income wise coaching um i think coaching golf is quite a unique scenario in the coaching world that the majority the vast majority are paid you know we're, we're, we're professional coaches i'll say professional coaches we, we're paid to coach we may come back to that one um so when i then moved down into sussex i then coached more and more um, and then I was fortunate to be able to sort of push away my retail responsibilities and my membership responsibilities and coach full time. Um, and through a number of opportunities to work in local schools and to get some funding, it became more and more apparent that I enjoyed coaching children. Um, and it, all, it, it, it occurred through when we had our daughter and she started to do ballet and dance and make a huge amount of commitment financially um to, to to do those active activities and I was still charging five pound a week roll up for children just to come along and I thought well if I'm going to charge more I'm going to have to do better at it um and I'm going to have to put more structure around it I'm going to have to understand it a little bit more and I can remember it was when Soph started doing ballet that was probably the the light switch for me um and, and it's it's mirrored really her journey and getting older and then my son's journey getting older and me focusing more and more on coaching children they've sort of mirrored each other in some ways um it's been fascinating and so I, I always sort of said I, I coached golf I then coached golf to children I then coached children golf and there's there's a distinct difference for me because coaching golf to children was me imposing golf on children an adult version, um, syrupy fun. I know you, I think we use the word that saccharine fun, um, adult version of fun. And then I started to realize that children are unique in their own way. So that's when I started coaching children golf. Um, and that's probably at the point where myself and my colleague Jonathan Shipstone, we sat down and we we wrote Jolf. And I say wrote Jolf. We had the opportunity to put together a coaching program for a facility we, we were working at and that launched in September 2011. Um, so a long time ago now and the business has morphed over the years but they were fantastic years uh, as we sat down to write it because we just started with a blank piece of paper 
and put a framework of learning together. It's got to be, had to be both right for the children, right for the parents, but also commercially viable as well, because we're selling it out. Um, and then I think through social media, quite a number of coaches got in contact and wanted to be part of it. Um, and then we, we delivered a number of workshops and I think that was when the journey sort of started into me doing it full time. Um, and then from then, probably to now, you know, I get up every single morning and that's what I am. That's what I do. That's what I love doing. And, you know, I'm fortunate to do what I enjoy. I mean, Jolf is very, very different now, 2021, to what it was in 2011. And it, and it has gone on a journey as well in lots of ways, both from a business perspective from a philosophical perspective, from a delivery perspective, from who we work with, where we work. Um, and just want to be able to deliver meaningful, and meaningful is a word that Greg um, led me to, meaningful experiences to children and their fam families every single time, because I vehemently believe that golf as, a, as, a, as an activity, and as a sport is, is, is amazing for children and families. You know, whether it be crazy golf, whether it be pitch and putt, whether it be going on out on an 18-hour golf course, it's such an enriching experience for them to enjoy together. So that, in a very short way, is my sort of journey as a coach of golf. Um, like I said, from coaching golf, coaching golf to children, coaching children golf. And I think now we, we sit in that sort of space of we – we play golf, we play golf. And when I say we, we as a company, we with the children we spend time with, we with the families we spend time with. It's a fascinating uh, trajectory and journey for you. And it's also has those interesting similarities when you talk to most professional coaches about the journey that they've gone on, that there are these disjunctures. There are these moments that just uh, you end up becoming a coach and then later you end up having to think a lot more critically about it. It doesn't, it's not something that just happens anymore. Yeah. And I think it's the critical bit because again, in 2011, I had the opportunity to go to Birmingham, University of Birmingham um, and be part of a cohort of PGA golf professionals who were the first group to be put on the postgraduate diploma course in sports coaching working towards level three and level four. They hadn't quite got it sorted there, but we were there. Um, so I'd never been to university before, you know. So that little sort of foot in the water of academia and that critical mindset, you know, so that sort of why and what and how and is that true? And, you know, so all the practice we'd done before, well, why had we done that? Well, because that's what we've always done. And I think it golf. I think like we spoke when we when we spoke originally, a lot of golf coaches, you know, we stand on our mats, on our driving range, and we deliver the experience to that person. And it, and it ends up generally being obviously a technically driven, this is the way you should do it, this don't do it this way experience. You then throw in the amount of technology that's now available. And I, and I think we've gone away from the, the person's experience and the enjoyment and the play element of it. Um, I mean, that's probably going on a sidetrack, but and that's where a lot of golf coaches will tend to gravitate towards expert players, um, technology, more and more technique. Whereas for me, I've sort of turned my back on that. I'm going to go and we want to put clubs in children's hands. We want them to, we want to create a spark. We want to be spark creators. Um, and then if we're spark creators, it's then offering a stripped back version of the game that creates that spark that allows them then to kindle it and create the fire and the passion to want to do more. I, I can certainly hear some of the influence of, of Greg Dreyer, as you, you mentioned <laughs> before, you know, and that's a call back to, to season one, but for me in this, this pod, and of course, you know, we, we were introduced to each other via Greg, um, you're describing there what what I've come across in in, in the academic literature called first fascination yeah. of of offering as coaches. Can we um, very often called sort of love of the game in in football coaching? Can I can I instill that love of the game in the foundation phase? So this first fascination with the sport, so that those players and young people will take on the 
motivation, the impetus to learn themselves, you know, to be self-determined across the course of their lifespan in the sport. Absolutely. I mean, the amount of people that say to us, you know, oh, you know, have you got the next Tiger Woods coming through? Or And I'm like, well, I don't care. Does, you know, and if, and if there is, if there is, if a childhood we've come into contact with through school or through job does go on to become that, well, that's brilliant. We're not going to be part of that. We're just the sort of the getting started. And I know it's a big part of it, but it's going to be all on them. It's all going to be all on them to take ownership and as you say, a self-determined nature of them enjoying the experience to start with. And then go and have some fun with it. Go and have fun with it. Go and love it. Go and enjoy it. Go and get into it. You know, we're here. We're here for you and we'll always be here for you. Um, but it's your game. And, and we, we talk about that. We sort of, It's their game, their time, in their way, at their, on their level, on their terms. And, and where, where we sit in that sort of first phase, that fascination phase, it has to be on their terms. I've seen too often, and I've, I've done it myself. Right, here's the club. This is how you hold. This is how you stand. This is the way you do We had it yesterday. We had an experience of yesterday where we were in a school and uh, in particular a TA you know, very much this, put your hands the right way around, put your feet in the right place, do it correctly. It's like, well, you know, no child's are ever going to learn, no spark's going to ever be, ever be created when the adult behaves or acts in that way. And I know they're coming at it from a, a nice space, but it's just, I don't know what the word is, a polite word. It's just misguided, isn't it? It's just a misguided approach. That was very politically correct. Uh, and <laughs> You know, uh, for, for those who know me and have ever seen me on a golf course, I am dreadful. I mean, it's it's probably, nah, I'll just put it out that it is my worst sport by by at least the sports that I've tried anyway, by some, some distance. Um, and I've always seen golf as kind of this very technical driven um, e- experience, this very technically driven sport because it, it's an individual sport first and foremost, but also that there, there are, uh, just like I suppose there is in football, there are certain degrees of movement that are going to have certain outcomes. So what I'd love to get into with you here is this space of you're trying to create something that's a meaningful experience for these young golfers. But whenever in most sports coaching uh, environments you start talking about doing that it seems to get misconstrued as this let the game be the teacher let the sport yeah. be the teacher and that the coach almost doesn't quite know where to put themselves and actually then can end up abdicating their role and i know that's not what you're saying so in golf how do you achieve both and as a coach, you're intrinsically involved in that process. It's an excellent question, and it's a question which I I ponder over myself, ponder with myself regularly, and challenge others regularly. So, golf at its very, very stripped back nature is, and I'll, I'll if if he is listening enough, you know, Gavin Cousins is a guy that I sort of reg, semi regularly speak to, and he described it as hit that with this over there so if you can if we start with that premise so we go into schools and we utilize some equipment called golf park so golf park is a it's a sort of pop-up golf course trees bunkers water so the environment is set up we've built a six-hole golf course on the school field and then really it's a case of right we need you to play safely sensibly and fairly so we set the parameters of rules and values that we're all going to adhere to we are all you know not just the children the adults are going to adhere to them as well and we want you to be kind we want you to be polite we want you to be grateful as we will as well and then we want you to hit that with this over there and so for me then that's that's the task set up and I have this sort of this framework of we've set the task we've given them the tool and then really, once we've set the task and we've given them the tool, I want to just sort of stand back and I want to observe. I want to see what skills they have. Now, if they're a four, five, six-year-old, you know, they might hit it left-handed, right-handed, croquet style, along the ground. They might have the club. What, what, there's a million ways they do it. And for me, that's what I love seeing, all of those lots of different ways to do it. 
Um, and we're looking at how they strike the ball and what the flight of the ball is. So if you see you've got task, tool, movement, look how they move to create the strike and the flight. We've got that base. Now we can start to add through whether it be different environments, whether it be different tools, whether it be different experiences, whether it be different games, different tasks, whether it be different instructions. And now we can start layering it up, layering it up, layering it up, layering it up. And we had a group of young children yesterday and we sort of said to the teachers, we've got 10 weeks with these children. We've got so much time. And I think often as adults and as coaches, we're in so much rush. We're in so much rush to get somewhere so quickly when actually if we're creating that spark, that fire in their belly, we just want to kindle it. How long do you want to kindle it for? Well, as long as possible. You know, kindle it as long as possible until they can kindle it for themselves and can, they can keep the fire going for themselves. Now, for some children, that might be one experience. For some, it might be 10. We don't know. But in children's activities and sports, and I think this is probably the same in adult sport, if you like, a bit like children in primary school with national curriculum, very narrow curriculum, and they've got to get places very quickly. They've got lots to know and lots to do, whereas we're going in and delivering an activity that's both intrinsically enjoyable, meaningful. We don't have to be in a rush. You know, if, if, if the end goal is elite participation, well, you know, in golf, elite participation is, what, 25 to 30? Stacks of time. If that's the goal, which for us it isn't, it's just put clubs in children's hands, let's sell the value, let's sell the beautiful game of golf that they can play together with their families. Yeah, that sounds sounds excellent. And I was just thinking about, I watched a documentary on Netflix some time ago. <laughs> and I The think short look, game. That's the one, yeah. Okay, yeah, and, and, world championship. Right, and it's you know you're looking at the the experience that these young golfers are having and they're either totally immersed and affected by their parents predominantly and it's, yeah. and it's you know it's cast in a, a very negative light or you had these characters that were totally oblivious to it and i, I sort of felt like it was the 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 characters that were oblivious to it that might actually have a chance because they're, yes. they're, they're not being as affected by the negative behaviors of especially their parent yeah and I, and i think over, over lockdown what i've what i've come to realize is that you know this sort of this sort of triad of child coach adults i wanted to take a piece out of that triad and i wanted to, to be child and adults and for me, okay, I'm, if, if, if I, as an adult with a child, have more experience of golf, well, that's fine, but I might not necessarily have as much experience of that particular child. And I, and I think sometimes in coaching, there's a hierarchical nature that the coach thinks they know more than the parent. And, and so, therefore, this triad of the coach, the child, and the parent, so... For me, I like to stand on a level playing field. We're just fellow learners. We're fellow players and we're fellow learners with both the child and the parents. And I think this is where a lot of sports get into, in my opinion, get into some real messy situations because they have this, right, as coaches or organisations, we know best. We're going to educate you, which I think the only word I can or I sense is it's patronising. Because I've been on the opposite side of it as a parent with sports. I've been educated through my children's sports and I find it unbelievably patronising because I'm coming to this sport and I might not know anything about a particular sport, but I feel like I know a little bit about coaching and learning and teaching. And they don't, they've never asked me that. They've never asked. They've never considered it. So this is where you know, it comes back to that what's our role? Should we stand back and observe? Should we just let the game be the teacher? Well, we're fellow players. We're fellow learners. I think as the adult, we do have a safeguarding role, you know, to set the boundaries of rules and not only set the boundaries, but also to probably uphold them as well. Like I said, rules and values for us are play safely, play sensibly, play fairly, be polite, be kind, be grateful. And, you know, in life, if we follow those simple things, things would be okay, wouldn't it? 
yeah some some of the language that we use in terms of how we see ourselves as coaches is is really important i think one one of the ones that i struggle with is this idea of the more knowledgeable other i know what it means i know what it's trying to convey but i'll often say what about more capable other because the more knowledgeable other it it, it does indicate this sort of so i know it's not what it means but it does indicate a sense of I know more than you. I'm going to tell you what that is. Yeah. Whereas if I think if I conceptualize myself as a more capable other, I'm giving myself the space to acknowledge that as an adult, I've been through more of the game. And that's probably the only reason that I'm more capable. Um, but then it also gives me the space with the, the young people to give them a chance to announce their own errors and therefore announce their own learning as well. Absolutely. I mean, you know, there can be nothing better than that child initiating the conversation. You know, I understand the task. So the task might be simply hit it from a spot into a circle like we did yesterday. I understand that task. I'm getting a bit of a feel for how this tool works. You know, I know I've got to hit it from this part and I know I've got to send it that way. But can you just come and give me just a little bit of help? Can you just come and talk to me about this? Or it might be, I might see they're struggling and they're off task. Can I come and have a go? So again, it's that sort of modeling behavior. And it's if, if I'm going to enter their space and their world, what I'm not going to do is impose me, my experiences and my thoughts onto them. Again, a friend of mine, Jonathan, who I spoke about earlier on, you know, he talks about teaching and learning and teaching and coaching is that, it's like having a gift. And, and if we're going to enter their, their space, it's, we've got to make sure that gift is ready and it's hand wrapped just for them. And, and in golf, because we do have this time and this ability to sort of step back, it's not fast paced like rugby or hockey or football. We, 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 we've got loads of time. Um, we're able to sort of pick our words really carefully and sort of look at the child and go, oh, that's really interesting. OK, what, 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 what happened there? Whereas what I see often, I see people go, oh, good shot. Well done. Fantastic. It doesn't mean anything. Mm. Mm. You know, whereas if you see it, let's say, you know, you hit a shot and it goes off to the left, whatever. Oh, it's, it's, it's interesting that. What, where, what, what did you sense happen there? You know, where was the club pointing? Which part of the club did you hit it from? It's neither good nor bad. It's just like, that's quite interesting. So it opens up that conversation. I might not know the answer, but I'm looking for you to sort of find your own answer with my, if you like, guidance and nudging. And and I might know where I might want to get you to, but as a coach, I often want to take the long way around to get there. Not, here's the answer, away you go. We always get challenged with, you know, when are you going to teach children how to hold the club correctly? It's a big thing, you know, for adults. Got to hold it correctly. Um, Well, we might never. That's my answer. We might never. And if we do a really good job, we probably won't need to either. And, 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 and that, I mean, I do it for a number of reasons, but that, that pricks people's attention because they go, what? Really? Because if we can give the right circumstances and the right tasks and the right tools and the right environments, you know, they're going to have to grip it in lots of different ways anyway. And children, the hands haven't formed correctly and bodies and just, just again, just nudging them in the direction as they go. It's it's such a fascinating conversation and, and in in the wider picture, because obviously we're starting to get into skill acquisition here. And I mean, I just find that a really difficult space to talk to people about that that very often there is this one family that you you kind of align yourselves with in terms of how does skill acquisition happen and I guess what you're describing sounds more ecological in its approach, but also that I don't think you're marrying yourself to one or the other. No, I, I struggle with that conversation. I struggle with that sort of you're one or the other. Um, and, and I don't think I'm either sitting on the fence either. I'm sort of saying, well, you know, I'm very clear with our, I'm calling it framework or structure or scaffold of task, tool, Movement, strike, flight, skill and knowledge. They're the things that I want to, in as stripped back way as possible, present to a child and then go, well, let's see what happens. Let's build, let's build, let's build. Now, 
from a business perspective, we, we're very much about we're going to schools and we'll probably deliver just one experience. We might only see children once because that's the way our business is structured at the moment. But we know that that experience is, come back to Greg's quote of meaningful, it will be meaningful for them. And then if they go and choose to do more, they've had a good start. They've, we've created that spark, not for all of them. You know, I'm, I'm not saying 100% of the children at the end of our golf experience love golf because that's just ridiculous. But I know that they've got the choice to love golf. And that, that's the really important distinction to make here, I think, that you know, I, I would think simply, uh, similarly about football coaching with young, young players. If a young player comes to me and says, you know, I really need to know how to hit the ball with my, my laces and, and really drive something and, and have, you know, less backlift, <laughs> probably not using all of these terms. I need to be able to hit it for, you know, over there to my mate 25 yards away. Of course, I'm going to give them some of the technical instruction that would lead to that. But like you said, not imposing that from the start, that they might find their own solutions to it. And being very much an outsider to golf, um, you know, I do watch it from time to time. One of the interesting stories for me would be, be Bubba uh, Watson, is it? Bubba Watson, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I remember watching something about him. And it wasn't a documentary. It was just a little cutaway from whatever the tournament was that I happened to turn on, talking about his technique and, and how yeah. he wasn't really coached. And it's very different to everyone else. It does feel to me like the, the sport of golf is seeing more and more technical variants at the top of the game. Yes, I think you're probably right. I think it, I've never spent a huge amount of time looking at it because that's not the sort of genre that, genre that I sit in. But if you go back to the days where David Ledbetter worked with Nick Faldo. So David Ledbetter was a, was a big name, not only a long name, but a big name in coaching golf. And he worked with Nick Faldo in the, um, my history, let's say the late 80s, early 90s. And they deconstructed his swing and he had a swing that did one thing and the, he went away and worked on it and he came back with a brand new swing. And David Lebeter was the sort of forerunner to coaching golf. And off him and a number of others, it became this profession. And I think David Lebeter, a number of other coaches and also driving ranges, I think have created how we learn golf. You know, you've got, it's got to be technical. It's got to be working on the swing and you've got to hit thousands of balls to get better. Now, Obviously, someone like Bubba Watson didn't play and learn that way. Um, but there are a lot of others that did and, and have probably crashed and burnt and fell out of love with the game as they go along. So I think golf was, and again, if anybody wants to come back and say that I'm wrong, I think golf was probably a little bit late to the party around maybe developing skill. I think they're very much there on developing technique, but for the masses... I think they were maybe a little bit later in developing skill um, because of the fact that, again, in my opinion, because lots of coaches are paid. We, we, we're a professional body um, and, and it's of, of, often the lessons are off course on a driving range or on a practice ground. You know, I'm struggling with my game. You, 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 know, you say, I can't, I can't hit it. So therefore, I'm going to have a lesson. Where would that lesson be? Nine times out of ten, it'll be on a driving range. Now, when I did coach adults and when I have coached adults in the past, 90% of my coaching has always taken place on the golf course. Always. And is, is that just a case of trying to make it more relevant, more realistic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Connect, connect with the person, connect with the person, understand them, understand their game, understand their, the game of golf that they play, not just the movement that they make in a in a in an isolated environment um and then and then be able to help them enjoy and play the game more yeah you know, whether that be a beginner who's playing the game or whether that be um an expert player you know the beginners that golfers that as i said not done this for a while but the beginner golfers that would come to me our first session would be let's go on the golf course we're going to go and play Here's the first green, let's have a putt. Here's the second green, let's chip in, chip onto it. Here's the third green, let's chip and putt. Here's the fourth green, let's hit over bunker. Here's the fifth green, let's hit an iron into it. Here's the sixth hole, let's play the sixth hole. That's your hour, if you like. 
do you want to come and do some more? Oh, yeah, I loved it. Really want to do some more. That's the job done, then, isn't it? Yeah, I, it, uh, I, I've had this conversation before about playing cards. Right. That, that you know, if, you, if you're playing cards, say, say you're playing Snap, you know, with a young player, would you deconstruct any part of that game to then teach them how to play Snap? You know, the, the primary bit being that end of kind of recognising the duplicate card and get your hand down as quick as possible. Are you at any point going to just go, we'll just do that last bit and I want you to think, work really hard on getting your hand down as quick as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, whatever the technique angle. might be, yeah, get your hand down as quick. You just wouldn't do it. Well, why are you removing the game from the process of learning the game? Yeah, we, I mean, that's that's where I describe golf and I've challenged quite a number of coaches, not just in golf, but also some other sports to say, well, if you strip the game back, if you strip everything back, what have you got left? And that's where we came up with, you know, hit that with this over there. You know, that's what we've got left. We haven't got anything left. And it, it became apparent for us, we did quite a lot of work in a, a special school just up the road. Um, and we worked with pretty much every single child in their in their primary school. So 70 to 100 children of, of all different needs and challenges. Um, and so we had to strip that offer back. And so that experience we had of working in that school with those children, and as for anybody who knows working in special schools, if you think about the needs of 20 children, 30 children in a primary school setting, um, and then you've got eight children in a special primary school setting, you know, they are all very, very different, very different indeed. Um, so we had to offer something that was quite different. And that's where we started to understand, here's the task. So for here's the tool, because for some of the children, just holding on to the tool was progress because they didn't have those reflexes. They weren't able to grip. And so then when, when we started to say, right, now they've got hold of it. Now we, we can help them move the tool. Now they can start to move. And it's just those tiny little movements. And so because we stripped it back so far, well, give us anybody and we know where to start with them because we've started with those children. Unbelievable experience. Again, I think coming back to developing oneself as a coach, let's say you specialise in this sport like we've done with golf, lots of different places with lots of different children delivering lot similar experiences, but they're all very different experiences. Yeah, well, that leads me nicely into, into this question and, and perhaps you've already started to answer one part of it there that, you know, if, if there were three tips, I'm going to push you for three, that you look to offer up to coaches of, of junior golfers, and it's important that we do make that distinction again, these are young golfers, what would those three be? Um, I think one of the biggest ones for us was to get other people to deliver job. That was that was. I say the biggest learning, that's a terrible, terrible English. That's the most learning we had was when other people started going into different settings to deliver on our behalf. Scary, you know, quality assurance. You know, they were coming up with different issues that we'd not had when we were delivering it ourselves. Um, understanding them as people as well. So, you know, if you want to develop yourself as a coach, let's say you have a way, you know, teach somebody else, coach somebody else, get somebody else to to deliver on your behalf because it's scary you know for me i don't know whether i'm a bit of control freak i must be but um it's quite scary really um and i think then once you've done that i think it's then that going into lots of different settings lots of different settings with lots of different people you know the experiences and the things that i've learned working with all the different children we do and i think importantly all the different teachers you know so we, we, we see them come across to us, they walk across the field, the teachers with the class. And I, I can suss out within about 30 seconds, generally, where I'm at with the teacher, where I'm at with the group, because we just, we just know what that look is. Um, and then probably the third thing is that, well, if you're going to present it to children, what's that stripped back version look like? So uh, I, we, for, a, for a couple of years, myself and my colleague, we ran... Hove Lagoon pitch and putt. That's that's another story. That's probably for another day. But <laughs> the point to this was we used to have people come down, 
they paid at the kiosk and they went on to the, the nine hole course. And this dad said to me, can you just come down and give him some tips? Okay. So that got me pondering it. I've got 20 seconds or probably less than that, 20 seconds to get give that child, give or enable that child something. And also a little bit to placate the dad who's asked me for help. What am I going to say? Or what am I going to do? And it was little experiences like that, um, which it was very much, you know, well, you really, you want to just hit that with this over there and move as far and as fast as you can. Because I know what dad was going to say. Dad was going to say, you know, hold it like this, keep your head down, keep your head still, don't move your feet, rendering the child's immobile to be able to hit the ball. Um, so the, 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 the 10, 15 seconds that I, if you like, delivered to the child, I was also delivering to dad as well. Right. So it's a sort of double right. double lesson. Yeah, and that's an important one, I think, that especially with uh, novice coaches, you know, learning to deal with the parental influences as we've started to, you know, talk about earlier. That is something that you, you just need time and experience on. And I think that there's a place definitely to validate parents. I always talk about starting there, you know, validate them in terms of they're probably having that conversation with you, whether it's a difficult one or or, or an easier one, because ultimately they want the best for their kid. And I think you, you have to start the conversation there that and, and let them know that you're the same. You want the best for their kid. Yes. Um, and, and I've mostly found that then those more difficult conversations suddenly become a lot easier because there's your common ground. Yeah, I think we always say you've got to start with empathy. You know, you've got to start being empathetic to the parents or family members or guardians or whoever come along because, you know, we as the coaches, we might have a rule book. We might have some something to follow. But, you know, as a parent... We don't know what we're doing. There's no rule book. There's no right and wrong. We're living with these children 24-7, trying to do the best for them, love them, care for them, clothe them, feed them. So I think it's having that starting from that empathetic position. And, you know, 99.9% .9 of parents will come along and, like you say, all want the best. But this rhetoric of problem parents, educating parents, it's so common nowadays, but it, it's tarring the majority with the minority's behaviour, and I don't understand it. I mean, again, I don't. We don't. We, cricket is sort of our family sport, if you like, but like football and with the, the the lines and the you know keeping quiet and stuff. And it's only the it's only the minority that are the problem. The majority aren't the problem. So why do the majority lose out because of the minority? Yeah, because yeah. like you say, you haven't had those difficult conversations early on. It's like, go, you know, as soon as you get that dad or mom or whoever who's giving it this, for me as a coach, I'd just go over and I'd stand this close to him, maybe tread on his foot, um, and just say, "Oh, sorry, um, what, what, oh, hello, what, what, what are you doing? Why are you shouting like that? They're not listening. They can't hear you. Mm -hmm. What, what do you mean they can't hear me? They can't hear you. They will not be listening." So there's no point in doing it. I know why you want to do it. And if you want to carry on, then so be it. But it's not what we do around here. Yeah. We have a chat. Have a chat before, have a chat after. And, you know, ask your child if they heard you shouting and what they said, because I'll guarantee you they won't have heard it. So there's no point in doing it. Yeah, that's fabulous. I like that. The sort of indirect uh, version of... Uh, directly dealing with something yeah. um yeah. i mean so much of it just comes from a counterintuitive position of the more i shout get involved push uh, the more likely my prodigy will turn into you know the best possible sports person they're going to be one thing i would note though and i and i do believe is that a lot of parents do probably co copy in some way shape or form coaches behaviors so if you think about, let's go back to football for a second. It's not, and it's not my area, but the coach will be shouting instructions from the sideline generally. So if the coach is shouting instructions from the sideline, well, how can you then say to an adult, another adult on the sideline to not do it? Because they're going to mirror and model the behaviour, aren't they? 
and say the same things. Um, and, I, and I've said that again, you know, when we as coaches, children and families come to us to golf for the first time, if the first thing we do is stand there and tell them how to grip it and how to stand and what to do and how to move, well, it's very likely that when mom, dad, grandpa, grandma, auntie, uncle come down to the driving range with the child the next week, they're going to do the same thing. So I think, you know, there's a lot of behaviours that we see in parents. They've got it from somewhere. They could have got it from their own experiences. But I would also question to coaches, you know, have they copied it from you? There's a really interesting bit there to talk about in terms of emotional contagion. Right. Whether whether what we're putting across, whether that's yeah. actually verbal or not, that those emotions roll over to the, the players, then potentially to the parents. But that it, it isn't enough to just say, I'm the coach, so I'm the person, I'm the focal point, I'm the one that will, will speak. You need to quiet down. It's not enough to say that. You have to live it, as you're saying. Well, we've, we've had people ask us in the past, you know, I've delivered at seminars and, and they'll ask me, you know, how do you deal with problem parents? Well, I don't have any. We, we, you know, we just don't <laughs> have them. I've had those conversations. I've got some that I might not have connected with and they might not have connected with me. And that's OK. You know, that's just human, human beings, isn't it? But, you know, some of the best relationships I've got with people are with parents of children that we've coached because... I want to get on with them. You know, it helps from a business perspective. Sure. Because they're the one paying the bills, you know, and, and I'm not saying that in a, just, it just, it's just true, but also they're generally nice people. But, but it's, it, but, and that's why for me, I've come to this conclusion. We've got children, we've got adults and okay. I might be the adults that's organizing the session, facilitating the session, collecting the money, doing the organization, but that, that doesn't necessarily put me on a higher pedestal than the rest of the adults that have come in. And I, and I think that's where over the last probably the last 12 months, 18 months of lockdown, that's where I've started to really, really understand. And now when you know we go to son's cricket or daughter's cricket, I, it's, I, I just step back and I just like to see the dynamic of all the adults, the coaches, the head coach, the academy director, and then all these people. And fascinating. I love it. <laughs> yeah, the, the the talent development environment. Yeah. And all of the various mechanisms, most of which are people, of course, that you know are involved in that does feel sometimes a little bit messy, maybe a little bit too much. I always enjoy it, it comes back round on Twitter pretty regularly, but there's a picture of I think it's Aguero and Messi watching their sons oh, i saw that um, one today that oh did you today. really yeah, yeah, and they're, they're yeah. just they're just sat on like sun loungers aren't they just just watching having a great time yeah um unfortunately you can't yeah. see more of that picture kind of the insinuation is that other parents might be up and stood by the side but you know that sentiment of you know if it's okay for the you know world-class players to sit and just allow their play their kids to play then it's probably yeah. okay for everyone else to do the same. Yeah. And I think it comes back to that. It comes back to that sort of the, you know, we said that the game to the teacher, the, the coach sits back. But but for me, I'm I'm always asking the question, well, let's see what you got. Show me what you've got. Let's have a little look. I'm interested to see. That's really interesting. Can you do it again? Can you do it in a different way? So it's not, I suppose there's lots of questions, but there's also, I'm interested. Because even as, I, even as I just say that, I think people take that questioning approach, but the questions they ask, you know they're not interested. So I do wonder, actually, if you're going to use that sort of questioning approach, it's doing it in such a way that they know that you're really invested and interested in them, what they're doing. And I suppose that loops back to that's why I love that word of meaningful. It, it, it means so much, doesn't it? And it's but it's so in, rich and deep and oh, it's brilliant. I mean, we've used loads of different words: brilliant, excellence, ex whatever. But meaningful is so much better. God bless Greg. Yeah, and I know it's well, not just Greg, but it's... leave us leave us with your your interpretation of what meaningful means in your context. I think meaningful is that spark. It's that 
it's the spark of children having that first experience. It's children having, I, I use the term, tie, tongue out tiger eyes. You know, so when children are, and I, and I always point it out to teachers because, you know, the child might be holding it this way around, you know, they might be holding it like an axe. But I'll say to them, goodness me, look at their, look at their tongue out tiger eyes. And they go, oh, yeah. You know, it's the same when we're building Lego, we're doing a jigsaw, we're eating chocolate pudding that we really enjoy. All these, those emotions. And I think when a child is in that space of play, a bomb could go off nothing else matters they're just there doesn't matter how they're doing it that for me is that meaningful experience and I think it's for us as the adult center to offer experiences and opportunities that can they can then make those choices and build and build and build because for us as I said it, it's it's about it being their game their experience their way on their terms in their time and that's a it's a real thing that we keep looping back to um and it might well be also because of the stage that we're working at. You know, would that work with an 18-year-old elite player? I don't know. I, I, I honestly don't know because that's not where I spend my time, my focus on my energy. But for the for the four to 11-year-old primary school child where we're putting a club in their hands for the first time, that meaningful experience is one where they go, I quite like that. I'd like to do that again sometime. And if we've done that, then for us, it's, it's job done. That's an excellent description. I'm, I'm, I'm hasty to make sure that we finish on that, that <laughs> lovely note. So I do always ask one last question, which is if you could have an audience with one person, any person at all, who would you choose? An audience with one person? Golly. That's a sidewinder isn't it yeah it's a it's a big question if you haven't heard, heard me ask it on previous episodes no, it comes out i wasn't nowhere. expecting that I wasn't expect- <laughs> do, you, do you know do you know the thing i enjoy most so my audience would probably be watching my own children play sport whether that be golf whether that be cricket whether it be whatever they choose to do you know some of the experiences we've had watching them play um because they've got to age now, you know, they're 11 and 15. So they're, they're, they're participating and they're, if you like, competing, you know, to whatever level. But it, that they're the things I've really, really enjoyed. That's and a that's, lovely interpretation. Yeah, sorry. I might have to yeah. come back on that one because that's no, a tough no, question. No, I'm, no, I'm, I'm going to take that one. Absolutely. I, I love the interpretation of that. You know, obviously most people and myself included would, would have answered with, you know, a specific person. Um, but to flip that on its head and kind of okay well an audience of an experience um, yeah that you're having with your i i like that i like well that. It, it, it's sim- it's similar to as i said as family we've just sort of really i've, I've never played cricket never played cricket neither than wife but you know we well you'll see, you'll see all the things. um and you know there's nothing better than we love going to we'll go to watch test matches county cricket 100 you know it's just sit there just sit there and just love it i mean you know james watch it all day every day so 15 year old daughter for anybody who's got 15 year old daughters there's a nod to everybody knows what they can be like and we'll go and sit and it's brilliant um and for us the club the club that we belong to that sort of community that sense of belonging it's 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 something extremely enjoyable our choice is cricket it could be golf it could be football it could be rugby whatever it is but um yeah they're 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 the fun times and that probably points to, you know, sport being meaningful again, you know, a different yeah, sport yeah. to the one that you're involved with most of the totally. time, but nonetheless meaningful. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you so much, Neil. Where, where could people find you if they wanted to reach out? Uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, all of the such goes and jolf.golf. Jolf.golf is our website. So if people are interested, um, if there are any school teachers that want us to come along to their school, you know, let's turn this into a business opportunity. Um, we're more than interested to talk to them um, with our whole play day offers. Um, but also, as you do, you know, I'm, I love just talking to coaches and talking to people about learning and sports. So if anybody wants to reach out, I'd love to share time and share voice. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you again. Just leaves me to say welcome to awesome. the tribe. Yeah, awesome. Thank you for your time, Tim. 
That's it for episode 10 of season three and our thanks to Neil for joining and giving us insight into his perspectives on coaching with junior golfers. As we mentioned in the episode, Neil was introduced to me by Greg Dry, who coincidentally will be the presenter of our next webinar. Greg will be covering pedagogical approaches and their alignment to coaching, youth participation and retention, and much more. Tickets will go on sale tomorrow with just 100 available, so go snap those up. You won't want to miss it. To stay in touch with us and our events, come join us at the developertribe.mn.co to journey freely and loyally towards effective coaching and coach development practice. I look forward to seeing and connecting with you there. And of course, back with the pod next week. <laughs>